Good morning and welcome to our service this morning. This is uh, the service for morning prayer for Pentecost 17, September the 19th, um, 2021. And we're still in lockdown. So uh, welcome to those of you who are watching us at home. And uh, we'll be using the first part of the communion service as a form of uh, morning prayer. Um, and so let us begin. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. And in Mark's Gospel we read, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. So let us pray. Almighty God, to, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus said this is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. So let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, confident in God's forgiveness. Merciful, Merciful God, God, our Maker and, and our Judge, we have, have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in, in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And in response to having been uh, absolved of our sins and confessed our sins and been absolved, let's say together the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ. With the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And our collect for today. God and Father of all, you have taught us through your Son that the last shall be first and have made a little child the measure of your kingdom. Give us the wisdom from above so that we may understand that in your sight, the one who serves is the greatest of all. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our psalm today is Psalm 1, and we'll say it, Responsorially by half verses. Psalm 1 Blessed are they who have not walked in the counsel of the ungodly, nor followed the way of sinners, nor taken their seat amongst the scornful. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on that law will they ponder day and night. They are like trees planted beside streams of water, that yield their fruit in due season. Their leaves also shall not wither. And look, 
Whatever they do, it shall prosper. As for the ungodly, it is not so with them. They are like the chaff which the wind scatters. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand up at the judgment. Nor sinners in the congregation of the the righteous. For the Lord cares for the way of the righteous. But the way of the ungodly shall perish. Glory Glory to to God, God, Father, Father, Son and and Holy Spirit, Spirit, as in the beginning, so now and forever. Amen. Amen. And our epistle reading is from James chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also, the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening? both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. For the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. And the gospel for today, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark, chapter 9, beginning at verse 30. Glory Glory to to you, Lord Lord Jesus Jesus Christ. Christ. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and on three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and were afraid to ask. Then they came to Capernaum, And when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about about who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. For the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to to you, you, Lord Lord Jesus Jesus Christ. Christ. In the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. How many times have you heard that? Or perhaps even said it? If, like me, you were the object of a certain amount of taunting at school, and you may have had a lot of practice with that little rhyme, either either having... Um, somebody say it to you or even saying it back to those who were taunting you. Sadly, it is a saying that is just not true. There is power in our words. 
Words can cause hurt to others. Sometimes long after the wound of a stick or a stone would have been healed and been forgotten. To put it crudely, our tongues are just a small chunk of meat that flaps around in our mouth. Yet it is the most visible part of our speech centre and it gets the blame for much of what we say. For many of us, learning to control our tongues is a lifelong exercise that takes day to day and sometimes hour to hour and minute by minute practice. And James, in our epistle, has some interesting things to say about our tongue. He calls it a fire, a world of iniquity, that it stains the whole body, that it is untamable, a restless evil, and is full of deadly poison. With a description like that in front of us, it's a wonder that any of us ever want to open our mouths ever again. Usually, and unfortunately, there is not usually much we can do about other people's words. But we do have a responsibility for our own words. Are we careful about what we say? Do we use our words to build others up or for tearing them down? Do we control our words or do they just flow out of our mouths before the before we've had a chance to engage our brain? Do we know when to speak and when to stay silent? Do we know when to ask questions? As the author of Ecclesiastes notes, there is a time to keep silence and a time to speak. There are many occasions when it is appropriate to speak when we want to express an opinion on on an important issue, when we want to deepen a relationship with another person, when we want to take our part in social conversation, when we want to offer sympathy or encouragement or understanding to another person, or perhaps when we want to stick up for someone. Conversely, there are times when we need to keep silent when we really don't know what to say about an issue, when we can vent nothing but words that hurt and damage, when we confront a mystery that is beyond our capacity to explain, when we are witness to searing pain that any word we say will sound shallow, and when it boils down to it, a a loving presence is all that is required. But it's not always easy to know whether it is a time for silence or a time for speaking. Sometimes we talk too much and try to dominate a situation in which we should be more open to the views and needs of others. Sometimes we are silent when we should speak out in opposition to injustice and evil. Sometimes we speak when we don't really know what we are talking about. And at other times we hesitate when we could offer word of words of comfort or support or insight to someone in need. Words come so easily and oftentimes come so thoughtlessly. And once they've been spoken in another's hearing, they're impossible to retract. Once the word has been spoken, it's out there. And how many times has a thoughtless word destroyed a relationship, ruined a reputation or changed the direction of a person's life? Just as James writes, like the bit in a horse's mouth or a ship's rudder, that tongue of ours can have a significant impact on on what happens around us. Life can be a bit of a struggle between knowing when to speak and when to stay silent, when to question when to find out what's happening. And so we find in our gospel for this morning 
the author of Mark describing, describing the interaction between Jesus and his disciples. Mark indicates that twice in this passage the disciples were silent when they heard what Jesus was saying. And their silence is ambiguous. This is not the first time that they have heard Jesus predict his own death and his resurrection. But this time they respond with silence. I imagine partly because of the the telling off that Peter got the last time that, that Jesus predicted his death. Regardless, their silence should not be mistaken for comprehension or concession. I think there's quite a lot of questioning going on in their minds as well as wondering what, you know, whether they're going to cop a telling off if they do open their mouths and speak. And their first silence in this passage comes in, in verse 32. They did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask. I mean, we can understand their hesitancy if we recognise that they had heard and had heard and seen enough in their travels with Jesus to have a handle on knowing what he was, that he was a prophet. But faced with Jesus' prediction, again, they don't want to believe that he really means what they're hearing him say. So why don't the, the disciples simply ask Jesus to explain? I think it's partly because they don't want to appear as confused as they really are. We've all been there, I'm sure. Been in a situation when something has happened or been, or been said and everyone else appears to understand. And yet on the inside, we, we are left more confused than before. And we find that we're too afraid to ask for clarification. Or maybe it is because their distress at his teaching is so deep that they fear addressing it because to address it, to ask the question, to seek understanding, is to see what they fear the most realised. So they remain silent because they don't want to hear what they fear they might hear. They fear to ask the question in fear of getting an answer that they don't want to hear. And we're not that much different from the disciples. It is at times easier to keep silent, to keep quiet, to pretend that we do understand, to pretend that we do understand than to ask and run the risk of hearing something that we may not like. No one wants to look un, uninformed, confused or clueless. I think all too often we withhold our toughest questions because we think that to ask them is a reflection on our faith. Questioning and seeking understanding is not the opposite of faith, but is in fact faith at work. And in fact when we do that, we're actually all doing theology. Because one of the One of the definitions of theology is faith-seeking understanding. To understand, we need to ask. We need to be open to ask questions and to seek answers. Some of them may not always be comfortable answers. But that is not the opposite to faith. The disciples... Second silence in this passage comes after Jesus asks them what they've been arguing about. This time it appears that the disciples keep silent because they're ashamed to answer him. Mark records they were silent for on the way they they had argued to one another, with one another, who was the greatest. Find that in verse 34. It's hard to imagine that the disciples had so little understanding of what Jesus had been saying to them that they were arguing about which of them was the greatest. It's hard to imagine that at least until we realise how often we would be silent if Jesus were to confront us and ask us what we had been talking about and perhaps thinking about. Just dwell on that for a moment. 
verse 34 reveals what happens to the disciples when they sidestep the real questions. The real questions that they are afraid to ask. They turn to arguing with each other, squabbling among themselves over the petty issue of rank and status. And there is a direct line drawn between verse 32 and verse 34. When the disciples avoid asking hard questions, they focus on posturing about who is right. And it must have come as a shock to the disciples when they realised that even if they kept silent, Jesus somehow knew what they were thinking about and talking about. How would this story be different if the disciples had asked Jesus their questions? What kind of conversation might have ensued between Jesus and the disciples? How would our stories be different if we asked Jesus our questions? What kind of conversations might we pursue with Jesus? How would our life as disciples together be different as a result? And I know we're we're back in lockdown, or I should say lockdown continues. But this is a a great opportunity while we are not out and about to ask questions, to spend time in silence and in reading the Bible and asking God to reveal what questions that you have in regards to those things, what you read. Take the time to, to ask those questions. I'm more than happy to try and answer them. It may take me a while to find out the answers, but I'm more than happy. Faith-seeking understanding. Don't be afraid to ask questions and to seek answers. The good news is is that Jesus welcomes us even when we do not understand and do not know. Our Gospel reading closes with Jesus embracing a child, the ultimate symbol of not knowing not understanding of immaturity and being undeveloped. We need not fear our questions, our misunderstandings or our confusion. We don't need to fear our curiosity in the presence of the one whose perfect love casts out all fear and who accepts and loves us as we are. Amen. So in response to being loved, let us together affirm the faith of the church. We We believe in one God, the the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and and earth, of all all that that is seen and unseen. unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the The only Son Son of God, God, eternally begotten of the Father, God God from God, God, Light from light, true true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. 
we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I invite you at the end of our time to, today, as the recording finishes, that you take time to pray for the world and for the church, for those who are struggling with the pandemic being locked in, not knowing um, when they'll be able to have more freedom, those not knowing whether they'll have work to continue to. Pray for them. Pray for those who are afraid. Pray for those um, staff, medical, nursing, paramedic, allied health professionals who um, care for those who are sick or seeking treatment. Pray too for the church that it might show the love of Jesus, that we all might show Jesus' love in what we think and say and do, and pray for each other. And so we bring all our prayers together as we say together, Our, our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive, forgive us our sins, as, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Amen. So let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the, in the name, name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen.